Podcast friends, check out my upcoming show list to see if your city is on my tour. And if not, leave a comment for where I should go next. Yes, and is the primary rule of improv acting. When you're doing improvisational comedy, there's no script. You're just on a stage with other crazy people and you are making up a plot and hopefully something funny as you go along. And any improv actor can tell you one of the big, well, the biggest rule is yes and. Meaning, if one of your fellow actors up on stage says to you and to the audience that some fictional situation is going on, you agree that that is what is going on and you build on it. So, for example, if your fellow actor walks on stage and says, it's so crazy that we are out here climbing a mountain, how boring and unfunny would it be if you say, no, we're boating down a river and then you guys just get it in an argument about what you're doing? Like <laughs> That doesn't make for a very good play. In order to have a really funny improv skit, all of the actors have to be building on the fictional premise that the other actors are throwing out. If there is a better metaphor for dealing with the craziness of life, I have not found one. I was thinking about this the other day that essentially the yes and mentality is responding to curiosity, responding with curiosity when something comes up that you didn't expect, whether it's good or whether it's bad. If something arises that you didn't expect, rather than rejecting it, you accept that it's there and then you do your best to build on it. So you're on an improv stage. You say, ah, here we are. And your fellow actor says, I just love it that we own a haberdashery. (laughs) And you're like, what is a haberdashery? (laughs) And so you can't up on stage be like, why do you you always have to come up with dumb stuff? I wanted to be floating down the Amazon River today. No, no. You don't reject it. You don't resist it. You don't start arguing. You say, yeah, okay. All right. I don't even know what a haberdashery is, (laughs) but I'm about to find out on this improv stage. Yes. Yep, we own a haberdashery now. And it's uh it's it's a haberdashery in the middle of the Sahara Desert, which is, you know, it makes it hard to get customers, but we're working on that. So you build on it. This will solve almost everything in your life. And I will tell you that uh it led to a fantastic experience for me where I I ended up on a plane. <laughs> From Austin to Las Vegas on a late night flight. If you have never taken a late not a late night flight from Austin to Las Vegas, you haven't lived. Nobody on the plane is sober. <laughs> Yet people are dressed in leisure wear, people wearing those, you know, the snugglies you would see advertised on infomercials. It's like a massive poofy blanket but there are holes for your feet to come out so you can wear it to an airport imagine wearing that and being drunk if that's you you were probably on that flight with me there was a so I was flying southwest because I am poor and the comedy millions have not come in yet so there I was on southwest airlines and you can choose your own seats on southwest airlines and I ended up sitting next to the most fun, fabulous, and wasted human being (laughs) on planet Earth. This young man, I'll play clips later. I have this on video. He was, it it was the most outrageous flight I've ever been on. Uh, I will say, this guy was so wild, I honestly thought they might land the plane. And that is not an exaggeration. I thought they might land the plane. He was being so wild. And he chose me to sit next to, which (laughs) honestly was great intuition on his part. In the whole airport, there wasn't a better person 
for him to have chosen to sat next to. And and it was very much a yes and situation for me. And the other passengers were actually asking me about it afterwards, how I handled the situation. And I should have told them to just look up my podcast on YouTube <laughs> and <laughs> check it out. This podcast is on YouTube. You can check it out. JF on YouTube.com that it will redirect you to my YouTube site where you can uh, like and subscribe and share all of my content. So JF on YouTube.com. So that we will talk about that, the yes and principle in the second half of the show. We always get to the main ta- topic in the second half of the show. In the first half, I am, I'm going to talk to you about how I have failed at something I've been working on for the 10,000th time. But see, I don't see it as failure. I see it as I'm iterating. I talked about this a little bit on the Village Hustle Patreon level a couple weeks ago, that you, you got to get this concept of iteration in your mind. And that is how you can live the great Winston Churchill quote, where he says, success is nothing more than going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Fantastic quote. I love that quote from Winston Churchill. And, and boy, is he a guy who failed a lot in his life when you read his uh, biographies. And, and he had this concept. He probably didn't use this word. But you got to see your quote, quote, unquote, failures as iterations. And it will completely change your life. So that will be in the first half. We'll get to the yes and idea in the second half. And don't forget that I am coming to a city near you soon. Today, tonight, I will be in Washington, D.C. at the Miracle Theater. The very next night, Thursday, I will be in Philadelphia with Caitlin. Caitlin is meeting me in Philadelphia. Then the very next day, Friday, we go to Boston. After that, Dallas, San Antonio. Then Salt Lake City, Jacksonville, Florida, Orlando, Florida. And I think we might be adding a surprise mystery city. You need to go to jfcomedytour.com to get all that info. And you should sign up for my email list because then you will be the very first to know when we, uh, if and when, and I think it is when, we add a mystery city to the tour. So the link to sign up to my email list is also at jfcomedytour.com. And then, of course, that is linked in the show notes as well as the link to join the Patreon where we always do an after party after the show. And then we have the Village Hustle level as well. Thank you for your iTunes reviews, your Apple podcast reviews. I was reading more of them this morning. They keep me going. Many Mondays mm-hmm. there. They are my reason for being alive. Uh, thank you so much. I read each one personally. Okay. So I have been on a quest to see if I can figure out how to lose a few pounds while I am on tour. Have you ever tried losing weight while you are traveling? Hard. It's, some would say impossible, (laughs) and I would see why they say it, especially that I'm performing. I'm not just traveling. I go out, it is an enormous surge of energy that I need to bring to the stage, and then whenever I'm able, I stay and I meet people after the shows, and and I'll stay, there have been meet and greets that lasted like an hour and a half. I will stay Mm -hmm. until the last person is done chatting with me. Um, I can't do that in every city, but the cities that allow me, I do that. So it's this enormous burst of energy. And of course, I, I need I need as much dopamine as I can get when I get back to the hotel. So of course, I want to have snacks or you know junk food, restaurant food, do DoorDash. But I can't do that as much as I would like or else I would be 500 pounds. It, it just it just it just wouldn't work. Now, and I know people are people often they're very kind. They say you don't need to lose weight. You know, don't have body image issues whatever. I I don't. I don't have any body image issues. It, it's funny I used to, but I just I really don't anymore. I'm happy with my weight. We've talked we talked about that in the famous weight loss episode. Caitlin, can you look up what that is? Yeah. Do you have an easy way to look at it? It's just search for weight loss. Um I, I talked about how uh I I now weigh I weigh 12 pounds less than I did when I got married. And that's after six kids. So I've cracked a lot of codes in terms of weight loss. And I'm a big believer that it's not about being thin. It's about being at the weight where you feel like yourself. I think that should be your goal. And for me, as you know, we've got the um, 
I'm really big on the Kibbe body types, K-I-B-B-E. You need to search that up if you don't know about it. And for my body type, I have the Kibbe dramatic body type. We look good when we are on the thinner side of things. So that is uh, episode 150. That's from April 5th of 2023. Episode 150, I went into... Jen, how is it that you <laughs> weigh 12 pounds less than when you got married after six kids? I, I went into all that in episode 150. So I do, I fluctuate with like kind of a five pounds that I wrestle with and, and want to take off. And I, I'm a big believer in being wildly ambitious as a hobby. Yeah. It, it, it's an interesting mental trick that, that you can do where it, it's like, yes, I really want to lose the five, 10 pounds, and I'm very motivated about it. But I'm also fine if I don't hit it. It, 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 this is, this is something that you should work on in life. Being highly motivated and caring a lot about the outcome in the sense that you'll work hard for it, you'll put a ton of energy into it, but you're not going to burn your life down over it. You're, you're fine if it doesn't work out. So that's how I feel about losing this five or 10 pounds. Like, whatever. I, it, I, I'm not living or dying by this, but, um, I have had, so, you know, I've been touring since 2019 and I have tried a lot of different things for losing weight and keeping up a weight loss routine. While I have like this week, for example, I have three shows in three cities in three days. Um, some would say that's, impossible to lose weight in those circumstances. And certainly my data would bear that out. Um, <laughs> that I, I have not really managed to do it yet. I've had some successes. But then, uh, like when I, when I was in Las Vegas, I just did I didn't have a good plan. And then I came home. And um, I wish I hadn't had that fourth pims and lemonade last <laughs> night a any any weight progress i might have made in las vegas i i very quickly undid as soon as i got home so um so i i've had um all failures and no successes in this department so but before i uh before i go into the concept of iteration and how you have to adopt this concept with whatever you have been trying to do for years and have had zero success at. I want to um, go back to my great role model who I I quote very often on this <laughs> podcast, more than I quote the Bible on this <laughs> podcast. Uh, it is, of course, DJ Khaled. He was, someone asked him about losing weight. And DJ Khaled is the mindset master. I, I've, I've told you about this before. He got a deal a few years ago with Weight Watchers. And I think the contract probably, the way these things usually work is that he would lose weight and talk about it. And he was on his Instagram talking about how Weight Watchers was so great. He's like, I'm looking felt. I'm looking amazing. He, I think he gained weight. He <laughs> had not lost any weight. He was still a very large man. But he kind of Jedi mind tricked us all into feeling like, I mean, he was probably like 380 pounds, but he was talking about how svelte he was. And so we were all kind of like, he's, he's pretty svelte because he's so convincing. Yeah. So I think that's why I'm obsessed with DJ Khaled. He is really the mindset master. And so his response here, this was after the Weight Watchers thing, someone asked him about losing weight. Um, particularly when it comes to weight loss, if you have anyone in your life, aunts, mothers, anyone who gives you a hard time about your weight, asks you if you're ever going to lose weight, maybe it's even just the voice in your head. Let I want you to respond the way DJ Khaled responds here. Caitlin, play this. It's it's just so incredible. Some people be like, yo, Khaled, I don't see you no lose weight because I don't lose. You know what I'm saying? All I do is win. Maybe you might not see me get rid of weight. It comes back, it goes. It comes back, it goes. It comes back, it goes. And what I love about that is that I don't stop and I keep going. And um, I have a certain number in a weight that I refuse to go over. So you got to see the keys I'm giving you because each key leads to the next key. Some people be like, yo, Khaled, I don't. <laughs> so, so that's what you need to say next time your aunt is like, don't you need to lose a few pounds? You, you can just say something that makes no sense. <laughs> um, like, I don't lose because all I do is win, Aunt Martha. Oh, I, I don't lose. I just win. And then you can go on to like say some things that don't make sense. And then 
So you got to see the keys I'm giving you. <laughs> you got to see the keys I'm giving you. I, I should try that today. I, I'll admit, I'm, I'm mildly hungover on this podcast today. <laughs> uh, listen, I, it's not, it's not my fault, by the way. It's not, it's the Pims and Lemonade's fault. There's something about that drink that it's like, you, it's, I didn't mean to have five. It's, and it, I feel like that wasn't on me. So if I say anything that doesn't make sense today, I'll just pull a DJ Khaled and I'll realize, you know, the, the last three sentences I said do not connect at all. Like there's no logical flow there and i'll be like so you got to see the keys i'm giving you one key leads to the next and then you feel like you're just not understanding my mastermind wisdom <laughs> when really i'm just hung over and saying nonsense um so just say just play that next time someone gives you a hard time about your weight like have you lost weight i don't i don't lose I don't lose because all I do is win. You got to see the keys I'm giving you, Aunt Martha. So, um, so that's your response if anyone gives you a hard time about your weight. But whether it, maybe it's not weight. Maybe for you, you're iterating on something else. Coffee. Um, <laughs> here's the concept of, of, of iteration. This is a term that I heard a lot when I worked in high tech. In order to have a product that is truly great that people really enjoy you have to go through a lot of versions of it so if you're trying to create an app that i was saying on the village hustle patreon the instagram app was originally called bourbon and it was missing some vowels i forget which ones to make it sound cool and it was it was just an app to check in where you were and I think bourbon had something to do with it, like the actual drink, but I forget what that was. So it, so it was this totally different concept and it didn't work that well. Well, actually, I guess it works okay, but then it, it kind of flatlined. Anyway, it, it obviously, nobody uses an app called bourbon, so something didn't work <laughs> about it. But like a lot of tech companies do, they iterated, meaning you put out a version you see how people like it. You see what works and what doesn't. And then you put out another version. And then you see how people like that. And then you change it. And then you put out another version. And it's called iteration. And in the high tech world, that is just, that's just a standard part of the process. If you work with any kind of investors, they would expect to see that. They would never expect you to have this one and done thing where you have an idea for an app and you put it out there and it's perfect and then nothing changes. That would be stupid. And I know that sounds stupid to you too. If you were investing in some tech company that had some new technology, you would absolutely not expect that they launch it the first time and then they wash their hands of it. Well, everybody here can retire because this just <laughs> runs itself. It's perfect. No, no, you iterate. And that makes sense to you when you're thinking about other people. But then when you think about yourself, you feel really bad when you don't nail something the first time. Or in my case, with trying to lose weight while on tour, you know, you feel bad when you've tried probably literally 500 different things and none of them have worked. You could feel like, I'm a failure and this is impossible. But when you have the concept of iteration, you just look at it like, all right, we're on the 500th iteration. <laughs> Let, let's keep going. And and this and I've commented before too that this uh, for my mom listeners, this happens to us a lot with trying to do chore systems, keep the house organized. You might have to iterate. I'm not exaggerating 50, 60 times through chore list systems, through ways to keep your house organized before you find something that really works. And then, by the way, as your kids get older or you have more kids or you move or whatever, you'll need to iterate again. You'll need to start the iteration process over and over. And, and a lot of times women will give themselves a hard time. They'll say, man, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I announced this big chore system with my family and that nobody's following it. And so that was a failure. And then I tried another one and that was a failure. And then I then I tried the sticker chart system. Didn't we all have that? Did you ever oh, yeah. try a sticker chart with your kids? <laughs> At least once or twice, and it failed both times. Yeah, man, has one. anyone? I, I man, that's the documentary I'll do. <laughs> Netflix, call me after you give me a million dollar comedy special. Let's talk about doing a documentary about the one family in America who had a sticker chart system that worked <laughs> for chores. There, do you think there's one, or do you think? 
like it's never worked for anyone i mean maybe for like a solid week it worked for them but i guarantee you no i mean over past. right like over the course like do you <laughs> nah. think no it never never no one i i, I this is like um this is like asking you to produce footage of bigfoot <laughs> I you you are more likely to find footage of Bigfoot riding the Loch Ness monster <laughs> than you are to find a family that has used a sticker chart system for tour lists that actually worked <laughs> over the long term. Never happens, but we all tried it. Oh, we yeah. all tried it. Yep. And then another thing we all tried is we all tried to have our home journal in the kitchen, like a paper journal that was like, I'm going to write my gratitude statement <laughs> in the morning. And then I'm going to write a list for the kids to check. And then it's like you find the the binder that is your life organizational system under the table. Um, someone's peed on it and you don't know whether <laughs> it's an animal or a kid. The pages are wet and they're also sticky. You're like, is that jelly? What is on there? And then and it's like your gratitude statement um, has been ripped in half and someone used it as a clean and you're just like this is this is a symbol of my life like this is my life planner and now it is sticky and it smells bad and it's disgusting and this is actually exactly how it should have ended up because this is a metaphor for my whole life so we all tried that um and here's the thing when you roll through things like that you can feel like a failure like what this is getting you think this is getting embarrassing i mean my husband has to think i'm such a clown that I announced this one, I announced this sticker chart system. And then I, <laughs> another part of my, man, I was really, I, the, the blog world really got in my head back in the day. Cause, cause you know what it was before, um, before TikTok and before video really took over, women could lie much more on their blogs. Oh, you yeah. young moms who talk about, you, you know, this is, it gets in my head, these TikTok influencers. I mean, I hear you, but at least they do have to have a corner of their house cleaned up <laughs> to put <laughs> it on video. video. These bloggers, looking back, I think some of them were living in a hoarder house. <laughs> they were surrounded by filth. Yeah, there was probably stacked up laundry from 10 <laughs> years ago sitting next to them, a bad smell you know the health department is banging on the door <laughs> and they were like i choose to keep my home tidy and arrange a vase of flowers in the morning <laughs> and so these women would just lie and lie and lie on their blogs and it just got in all of our heads and so i also had i i would some blogger said that like if you if you play music with your kids and it's like the same song every day they'll want to clean up that worked for two days. They were very excited about the little cleanup song that I played. And first of all, it was just like, this is why some women feel like motherhood is not for them. Because it was this nursery rhyme song with these little kids being like, clean up, clean yes. up. But do you, did you yes. have, you've heard that? <laughs> and I was like, I'm a grown woman. I'm a, I have an education. Like I have read books and know things. And I am spending my afternoon listening to the most insipid music, but it's what I have to do to, <laughs> to get chores done around here. And the kids kind of liked it, but then they caught on. They were like, this song really sucks. And, it's like, <laughs> and they're like three thinking the song sucks. So, and then they just started rebelling against the song and they would scream over it and throw things at the speaker. That's when we moved to the, the sticker chart. Um, and my kids really, they're smart. You know, they wised up quickly. They're like, yeah, we just won't get a sticker. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not going to world. sweep the floor <laughs> and I just won't get a stupid sticker. Keep your sticker. I'm not sweeping that floor, <laughs> which is, I admire it. I mean, I would have done the exact same thing. I was like, you know, honestly, that's pretty smart. I, I get it. So, I mean, the iterations that we have gone through. And, and again, in each phase of your family's life, you, you kind of have to start the process over because getting getting kids who are, two and five and six to do chores is different than getting kids who are 10 and 12 and 15 and whatever to do chores. So recently I went through another iteration process and I, I, I forget the number I put on it, but, but I'm not exaggerating. It was 20 things that I tried. It was 20. We finally found a system that, um, that is pretty much working for us, but, but I had to try 20 things that failed. And luckily 
I have the concept of iteration, so I explained it to my families, and I would just announce the first thing we tried. I said, look, I don't know if this will work, but this is how I'm going to convey chores to you. This one was an app-based system. There was an app where I could kind of send out the stuff to the kids, but then I realized one of my kids, does he's not old enough to have a phone and blah, blah, blah. It was just too easy for the kids to, to blow it off. Oh, oh, and then <laughs> they Jedi mind tricked me. This I <laughs> was really smart. One of my kids... The, the, I, I caught them not doing their chores, protecting identity here. And they were like, well, mom, I mean, you've talked to me a lot about not being on screens. And I, I personally, I just choose to put my phone away when I get home from school. So I didn't, I didn't see what was on the chores app. So I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, touche. <laughs> Round of applause. Touche. Touche. <laughs> so I iterated. I was like, okay, okay, child, no problem. I'll, I'll find it another system. So I really admire your <laughs> dedication to, to not being on your phone. I'll find a different system. And um, so, so we went through, I forget what some of the other ones were, but I, I had some note cards or something. Oh, I know. I, I had, yeah, I had note cards that I would leave on the table and, um, the, I, you know, I would find them under the couch, like in the <laughs> trash. So finally, I, I found a system that works. I, I print out, I print out a, a page for each day and I, I post it a paper in the kitchen. And then that way, when I'm traveling, I can ask someone, I'll say, text me a picture of the list so that I can see who has checked out what. And that's working for now. But I don't think this is a one and done thing. I assume that this will stop working at some point. And what will I do? What's the word, Caitlin? What will I do when this stops working? We're going to iterate. Iterate. <laughs> I'm just going to iterate. And listen, that is how... Listen. One of the most important qualities that you can have is the quality of being indefatigable, meaning like you can't be stopped. You, you are relentless. You're relentless. You just can't be stopped. It's, it's a great quality to foster for your family, for your work, for your hobby, for your marriage. Having that unstoppable, relentless quality will give you a really, really good life and a really, really fun life and a life that your family really enjoys sharing with you. That that indefatigable, relentless quality. One of the highest compliments I've ever gotten is that people have said that I seem indefatigable. I know people with big vocabularies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're they're very educated. People have said that I seem relentless. Now, when they said that about me, I think they were trying to express concern. Um, they were like, Jen, you sent us a text at 2.48 a.m. Um, and then you were back on email at 9.15 a.m. Um, you sure are relentless. <laughs> like I, They were kind of trying to be like, Jen has a problem. Um, but it has served me well. And the way I foster this quality is that I see my failures as an iteration, not as failures. And that, by the way, that is how um, when I had struggled with weight and on and off alcoholism, for many years, for my entire adult life, and if we're being totally honest, into my teen years as well, um, after after 25-ish years of having various weight struggles and um, struggles with drinking too much and all that, when I was 40, I finally figured it out. When I, was, I was almost 41 when I finally figured it out. And I had had no lasting success between, you know, ages like 15 to uh, 40. I, I'd, had, I'd had no lasting success. Like nothing had worked. I'd tried everything. But because of that concept of iteration, I just wouldn't give up. I was like, I'll keep iterating until I figure this out. And then again, I went into details in episode 150, the weight loss episode. But I figured it out at 40 years old. And then, you know, I lost all this weight. Uh, I was... At that time, I weighed I weighed forty pounds more than I do now, and I had major lifelong struggles with alcohol. I this is bad. So clearly, I didn't plan this out because I just told you guys I'm hungover. But <laughs> but 
Um, I do intermittent sobriety. I'm very comfortable with my relationship with alcohol now. Uh, it just so it caught me on a bad day to bring <laughs> this one up. Um, but um, I, I'm very comfortable with that area of my life now. I didn't figure it out until I was 40 years old. And, and that was after two and a half decades of trying to figure it out. And the reason I didn't give up is because of that concept of iteration. Lost 40 pounds, got my relationship with alcohol under control, and I've, I've kept that weight off. And sometimes it fluctuates here and there, but I've kept that weight off for years now. So um, that is the secret to being relentless. That is the secret to not quitting. That is, that's like the Thomas Edison thing. You know, he, um, hang on, let me get this number. How many times did Thomas Edison fail? Let's see. I think it's, yeah, okay. So he, um, he wanted to invent the light bulb. He wanted to, I mean, he knew that electricity was, you know, out there and something that might be fun to, to play around <laughs> with. I'm doing a great job of um, <laughs> explaining this. So um, he famously tried 1,000 times, and it was about on his thousandth time that he figured it out. And now, thanks to him, we, we have podcasts. We have my YouTube yeah. channel. I mean, none of this would exist without, without his... 999 unsuccessful attempts and we hear that we throw out those numbers but really imagine being that guy I mean really think about it like it takes time to do each one of these attempts mm -hmm. so you you get everything all set up okay oh I think it's gonna work all right one and done uh that doesn't work yeah you go back to the shop you set it all up again you get the wire you get the whatever and then it's probably another day like so that feels I mean really think about how much 999 is and 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 i honestly think not to compare me fitting into my skinny jeans to the invention of the light bulb <laughs> but um honestly my it, it was harder i swear being listen being a woman who had six babies in eight years and has food addiction tendencies to figure out how to lose enough weight that you weigh 12 pounds less than you did when you got married and you keep it off easily. Honestly, that's harder than inventing the stupid light bulb. I could have I could have discovered electricity 50 times for what <laughs> it took me to figure out how to be at a thinner weight and stay there easily. Honestly, seriously, give me a light bulb invention any day. If I had put the effort, the mental effort and stamina that it took to figure that out into discovering a resource of, uh, uh, of renewable green energy, we wouldn't have an environmental crisis. I could have solved all this for the mental energy that I put into this weight loss thing. And honestly, I, I stand by that choice because I've got some genes. I, I feel really good about how I look in them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, also keep in mind, I have to see full, full body video of myself mm -hmm all the time because of the nature of the work that I do. Um, so, I mean, it was, <laughs> I, 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 I need to be happy with how I look. So anyway, um, but that, I mean, whether you have a, a weight loss goal or a, a goal of finding your, your blue, blue flame and using it in, in an exciting way, you live in a culture where that will not come naturally to you. You don't have a support system. If it's something work or hobby related, you don't have the support system you need. You, you don't live in a village. You're trying to do all this on your own. You're trying to do the job of quite literally 15 people every day. And so how do you f carve out space for your passion and maybe bring in a little bit of extra money in those circumstances? It can be done, but like Thomas Edison, you will probably have to iterate 999 times before you figure it out. And if you don't see it as iteration, if you see it as failure, you'll quit. You, mm -hmm. You'll quit. You won't figure it out. And same thing with weight. I mean, we th there are studies that show that processed flour and sugar and things like that are more addictive than cocaine. It is easier to quit cocaine than it is to give up sugar and processed food 
And I know some people who have lived some crazy lives and <laughs> can affirm that. And because also you're not surrounded by it. You don't yeah. stop into the grocery store and someone's not like, hey, would you, you know, like a little bit of cocaine while you're here? I mean, you're <laughs> surrounded by these addictive products. So, yeah, if you are trying to do anything health, weight loss and, and fitness related, yeah, you're Thomas Edison freaking discovering electricity and figuring out how to harness it. It's going to take 999 times before you find a system that really works for for your food addiction profile, for your lifestyle, for your tendency. Do you like to work out? Do you not like to work out? Like, did I mean, it has to be custom to you and it will take you 999 times to figure it out. And again, if you see each time it doesn't work as a failure, you will get discouraged and you will quit. If you see it as an iteration, you get in Thomas Edison mentality. And you're like, oh, I'm going to get this. I'm going to invent this light bulb. It, it it might take like Jen with her weight loss journey. It might take me 20 freaking years, 25 years. But I'll just keep iterating. <laughs> I'll just keep <laughs> iterating. And then here's the other thing. Last thing I'll say about the process of iteration is... Um, when you have an iterating mindset rather than a failure mindset, you learn from each failure because you feel kind of positive about it. You're in the mindset of, okay, so let, again, let's take it back to me trying to lose weight on tour. Because I don't see it as a failure, I just make notes in my journal. So for example, I made a note uh in Vegas. I just did not really plan it that well. And, and I realized I, I can't just spontaneously decide what I would like to eat when I am getting back from a very high pressure show at 1148 p.m. I, my body's on the time zone that's two hours ahead. And I'm just like, I mean, I just turn into Jabba the Hutt. It's just <laughs> like everything needs to be going into my mouth immediately. The more sugary and sweet and processed, the better I'm going to get one of everything on DoorDash. I, I realize I, ca I this cannot I cannot make spontaneous food decisions after a show. It has to be ready. It has to be at my hotel. It has to be planned out. So that's an example of if I saw it as a failure that I binge. I mean, I it was wild. It was it was some amazing binge eating that happened in Las Vegas. <laughs> if I saw that as a failure, I would just sit around and like feel fed and feel bad about myself. But because I saw it as an iteration, I just chirpily made notes in my journal like okay well what I learned as I was eating the second hamburger with the <laughs> family size bag of chips is that I, I I just made notes and that's that's the thing about iteration is it's not just that you keep trying that that is the salient part of it but it's that you keep trying and you're in a good enough mood about it that you are willing to learn from each failure quote unquote failure when you feel depressed about something not working you just don't want to think about it anymore yeah. when when the sticker chart fell apart it's like I just tore it off the wall and <laughs> ripped it up in disgust and I was like I'm not good at this I'm ruining everyone's lives with my bad motherhood so obviously that's not helpful whereas more recently when I got in an iteration mindset so for example when when that when the chore app didn't work out uh, I just I, I, did, I wasn't discouraged about it because I knew it would be an iteration process. So I did write down what I learned and I made notes in a little journal. I said, so this one, the app didn't work because the kids tell me that, that they're not, they don't want to be on screens after school. <laughs> that maybe that was, if I were their age, that would have been a ruse. I don't know. Maybe they're even being honest, but it doesn't matter because the point is that didn't work out. So now I can cross online systems off of my list. We'll go back to paper, see if I can find a different paper system that worked. The last paper system did not work, but is there a way, you know, if I put it up on the wall so these papers can't get scattered everywhere, would that work? So you have to be in a good mood in order to learn from things that didn't work out. And the iteration mindset lets you be in that good mood so that you can learn from what failed. Now, before we go on to the main topic, I realized I never introduced the show because I got <laughs> on such a roll. I know. Okay. Caitlin, you need like a bell to ring uh -huh. when, um, oh, hit the, I forgot to introduce the show sound effect. We do have a special sound effect for that. Yeah. There's thank that you. One. Yeah. Um, 
Friends, welcome to the Jen Fulweiler Show from Austin, Texas. I am your host, Jen Fulweiler. I am a stand-up comic, best-selling author, and mom of six. This podcast is where you learn the art of the village hustle, being a hot girl, girl boss who knows that love and family and community are the foundation of all true success. Caitlin White is our lovely producer, and we publish new episodes every Wednesday morning. All right, let's get to the main topic. I So I took a late-night flight to Vegas. <laughs> And um, I, I'm going to play a video for you of the amazing young man that I <laughs> sat next to. He's 30. Um, and uh, this was at this. This is as sober as it got for him. And it not not super sober. Um, so he he had been sitting somewhere else further back on the plane. And then he started dancing um, <laughs> and he had a drink in his hand. And um, so he is he's hooting and hollering, shouting at people on the plane, happy, happy, you know, jovial, high fiving people, high fiving the flight attendants again, flying southwest because the comedy millions aren't quite here yet. (laughs) And there was a seat open next to me and he saw me and something in his subconscious realized that of all people in the in a hundred mile radius of the Austin airport that day I was the best person he could have possibly sat down next to it's Mm -hmm. wild that he changed seats he was sitting somewhere else is dancing through the aisle sees me sits down next to me so he sat down in a middle seat and Caitlin you can play the first video where he proceeds to try to convince me to switch seats with him (laughs) Says he'll buy me how many shots? Uh, 27, 17. How many, how many, how many does it cost? Uh, to that, that, switch seats because oh, so so I'm that, in the aisle seat. So that was take uh, one. That, oh, that was take one. We're going we're gonna to do like this. Okay. Huh? Oh, oh, take two. He didn't like his hair in the first take. All right, so play take two, Caitlin. Okay, this is take Ooh. two. Is your hair okay for this take? Yeah. All I know is this. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Five shots, okay. ten shots. <laughs> Yeah, 25 to shots. switch seats with me. Doesn't matter to me. Yeah, but I hate the middle seat. I'm figuring that if I give her enough shots, she won't be claustrophobic. Oh, that's Guys, a good, what yeah, do you think? Let's do a poll. True. Yes, that's true. true. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, 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 we'll do a poll. Okay, and then last video, Caitlin, you can play the last one. I can't do shots because this is a work trip for me, so, so I am, I'm being responsible. Some people say tomato, some people say tomato, yeah. some people say salmon, some people say salmon. What are you drinking? What did you bring I, on I, this? I, I brought apple juice, baby girl. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, you got apple out. juice. Okay. <laughs> I need some of that hey, apple. Hey, this is Will you thing. buy me some of the apple juice? No, no. This is called non-claustrophobic juice. Okay. This makes you not claustrophobic at all. Yeah, and that's, it's probably not illegal to bring that on the plane. It's literally apple juice. So we played the video. You can see on my hot fire YouTube channel, JF on YouTube.com. You can see this episode. This is episode 175. You can see the video, see what this young man looked like. So I I do not know this for sure, but I I believe that he tipped off one of the flight attendants. I do not know this for sure. I am just guessing because he proceeded to have um, six more shots of vodka during the two and a half hour flight. And also, ain't no way that was apple juice in his cup. So (laughs) it's funny that Caitlin and I were just talking in, in the last after party on Patreon. We were just talking about our fascination with people who can tip off either hostesses or whoever to kind of get what they want like get a seat at a crowded restaurant so i am pretty sure that my plane friend (laughs) did that because there's no way that they didn't cut him off okay so um i i am i'm a very introverted person i hate the idea of people talking to me on planes however if you are there there is actually a tipping point where it comes full circle. If you must talk to me on a plane, I do ask that you have a total of about 10 shots of vodka it plus a mystery drink that you bring on the plane and be completely insane and unhinged. At that point, I am actually okay with you talking to me <laughs> on a plane. So, um okay, so throughout this flight, this uh this 
young man. I, I know his name. Uh, let's call him Chris, uh, <laughs> just in case anyone recognizes him. I'll call him Chris. I do know his real name. We actually exchange numbers. I have his number. Um, so Chris proceeds to, like at one point he was climbing over a seat because he saw a gentleman with a mustache he admired and he just had he was yelling at this guy about his mustache and he just had to give him a fist bump um chris would hit the hit the stewardess call button just really whenever anything came to mind he would want to tell the (laughs) stewardesses that they're doing a great job ask for more vodka um just, you know, shout some affirmations. It would just be like, ding, ding, ding. And, and I, I can't emphasize enough how um, how loud he was being. I mean, the whole <laughs> plane was was quite aware of what was going on. When he got up to use the restroom, you know, a little bit more dancing, more shouting, fist bumping people, um, just, you know, go, going up to random people in random rows and commenting on their clothes and just talking about their hair or what they were wearing and just every interaction was very loud and very jovial. And, um, were other substances involved? I don't know. I don't know. I can't say, I I can't say for sure. Um, I will say when I've been around people who were on certain other substances, it sure did remind me of, (laughs) of this young man's behavior. But, um, so we had one of those very like, uh, It was an interesting but yet aggressive conversation where he was like, uh, he's like, I'm motivated. I win in life. You don't know what it's like (laughs) to be motivated. And I was thinking like, you don't know who you're sitting next nope. to. So I, I was like, well, I, I'm i going to set him straight. So I, you know, I, I told him uh, what I did. And what's funny is he reads all these motivational books, but I had read more than he had. So I was <laughs> quoting back to him. This is like for those of you who are good people, if you ever get in like a Bible verse quoting contest, <laughs> I got in a motivational book quoting contest. I was like, that's not from Seth Godin. That's from Tim Grover. He said that in Relentless, <laughs> not winning. You don't know Tim Grover. And so, so then I start shouting and by the, I wasn't drinking this was him so with like the two of us are just causing a whole scene um it was mainly him honestly I was not shouting that much but so this is the full two and a half hours I mean this did not stop once he was he was very hyped up so then like he wanted to try my headphones and and then like he had me try his headphones and we were comparing each other's headphones and he was, and then he wanted to see my comedy. So we pulled up, uh, we pulled up some of my comedy clips, and he was like laughing very loudly, like whole people at the back of the plane could hear him loudly. <laughs> so at the end of it, um, so so then like he takes he takes this really long time. He holds up the aisle when people are trying to get off the plane because he's like dropping stuff and yelling at people, and he has to talk about who's a top G and not a top G. Before, <laughs> and the, I mean, people were shouting at him at this point because they couldn't get off the plane because he was talking about various top G related issues. And so what? And after we got off the plane, a couple of people said. Thank you for your service. <laughs> like, that, <laughs> like he, you contained his energy, and it was very clear that he was going to share that energy with the whole plane. Yeah. If I had not contained it, and I felt that I very much felt that that God had sent me into this moment to entertain our friend Chris, <laughs> and I truly felt like my whole life had led up to this moment. Um, one of the things I learned is that I. Honestly, that conversation was really on my level in the sense that it, it was extremely intense, slightly antagonistic, <laughs> all about who's winning and who's motivated and how you succeed and, and just be at the top of your game. And it jumped around between subjects about every four seconds. We could never <laughs> stay on one subject. And I realized... You have to have 10 shots of vodka because I think he had some before he got on the plane and then he had six on the plane. So in order to have a conversation with me that I feel comfortable in and and can enjoy, you have to have about 10 shots of vodka and then also probably be on a certain hard drug that is <laughs> known to make people very chatty. Again, in case anyone recognizes him from the video, I want to emphasize I do not know that that maybe he's just naturally super energetic and likes to talk about all his big ideas. But I was just laughing because I thought 
That's what it's like to be in my brain all the time, honestly. <laughs> I was so tracking with that guy. So anyway, um, that is what I've learned from myself as an introvert that um, either I want people not to speak to me or if they do, I want it to be the most insane, antagonistic, competitive, unhinged conversation ever. It also got very <laughs> personal. He was asking me all these personal details, talking about his personal relationship, lots of details, lots of personal details about his relationship. And I said something like, um, oh, I wonder, I wonder what your girlfriend would you know, think about you saying that. He's like, oh, she's five rows back, <laughs> so she can probably hear this. <laughs> like, it, was, it was incredible. Now, this leads me up to my point. A few people on that plane asked me afterwards. They said, hey, how did you do that? Because it was a full two and a half hours of wildness. And that and it it felt like three. Actually, the flight really by the if you count runway time, it was probably more like three hours. It was a full three hours of wildness. And I will say I had work to do. I planned to work on that whole flight. I, my laptop was all charged. I was ready to go. So I was missing three solid hours of work time. And I realized it was my yes and life philosophy. I learned this from improv people. There's some books about it written by um, improv teachers. There's I used to have on my Sirius XM radio show a great gal. She has a a group called Improv It Up and they they travel the country and they do these kinds of improv lessons for corporate groups and nonprofits and it's a lot of fun. I love those guys. So she on my radio show taught me a lot of this too. Those were fun interviews where, where I would talk to her about this. So I, I took away a lot um, a lot from it. But the plane example made me realize how valuable that yes and wisdom is and how much it has changed my life since I adopted it. it if, if I had had that plane experience 10 years ago, I, I would have always thought it was funny. I Again, I can't be bored. As long as people are not boring me, I'm fine. Like you can say any manner of unhinged nonsense to me. You can even be rude to me <laughs> as long as you're not boring me. Like don't talk to me about boring things. So I would have always found him kind of entertaining. But in the past, I would have been very stressed. I would have been stressed because for a while people thought I was with him. They probably thought I was his mother. Like I, I don't know <laughs> how they thought we were associated, but th I think they thought I was with him. So I would have been worried that people um I would have been worried that people thought that I was somehow, you know, responsible or encouraging this. And and let me tell you, there were a couple points I honestly thought I thought if if this gets crazier, I think they're going to land the plane. You've heard of that happening. Sometimes they'll do an emergency landing for unruly passengers. It wasn't quite at that point, but I thought if he kicks this up one more notch, we I like it's actually at that level. It is it's that crazy. And um and so there was a time when that would have stressed me out that I would seem to be associated with it. I would I would worry about what people thought of me. And honestly, I would just be worried I had freaking work to do. It, my my Vegas, I had two shows in Vegas. I had a weekend of shows in Vegas and I was not fully prepared for them and I had really planned on having that 3 hours on this plane to do the work. I do a lot of great work on planes. That that was just part of my process. So I would have been kind of upset about that sort of resentful I would have had a why me attitude like there's this whole plane there were other empty seats why me I had work to do why me you know why why do I end up being um you know brought into the craziness but man I'm telling you the improv yes and philosophy has brought me peace in so many crazy situations and sitting next to a wildly, fantastically drunk guy on a plane <laughs> has um, it is not the least of them. But so, so, so that was my philosophy in that moment. Yes, and so yes means you see your whole life as one big improv sketch, and you should honestly. Does your life not feel like a big joke? Sometimes, Sometimes yeah. <laughs> you, you, it'll bring you so much peace when you just realize your life is one big improv sketch for the amusement of God and his heavenly host. Mm -hmm. Based on this understanding, 
you can now have a yes and attitude to everything and laugh at all the ridiculous things that happen to you. That needs to be your life philosophy. And that's how I looked at it. I, what, what can you do but laugh in those situations? So I, I, I just laughed. I just started laughing that, okay, all right, well, no work is getting done and that is for sure. And so the yes is, I accept this situation. Maybe I can change it later, but in this particular moment right here, right now, I can't change the situation. It is what it is. So I say yes to it. And when you say yes to a situation, it means that you respond with curiosity. Again, like I said earlier, on the improv stage, you respond with curiosity when one of your fellow actors suggests a premise. Again, they say, hey, how much do we love it that we own this haberdashery? Maybe you didn't want to do a sketch that was a haberdashery. You wanted to do a sketch that you're climbing Mount Everest. And you have that feeling of like, oh, but this is so dumb. This this isn't going to be funny at all. But the premise has already been put out there. You can't take it back. You can't you can't change what your fellow actor just said to the audience that you have a haber haberdashery. So you say, "All right, yes, it's a haberdashery now," and that puts you in a posture of curiosity. So how can I build on this to get an outcome that I would be happier with? So if you wanted to do a Mount Everest sketch in a yes and mentality, you say, um, how crazy is it that we own a haberdashery on Mount Everest? It sure <laughs> is cold up here. And so you you build on that the, the premise that has been put out there. And so that's what I did when I ended up sitting next to, and, and again, I love this guy. I thought he was so fantastic. Uh, and, and by the way, he might come to one of my shows. I don't want to say where he's from, but he lives in a city where I have a show. And I actually texted him. I was like, please come to my show, please. <laughs> that would be so much fun. Um, so uh, so I, I just shut my laptop and said yes to the situation. Um, the good people of flight, whatever it was, flight 6284 <laughs> from Las Vegas, from Austin to Las Vegas, they need me in this moment. <laughs> As someone who works with stand up comedians and is around crazy people all the time, I feel totally equipped to handle this situation. They need me. So I am saying yes to this situation. And then the and was how do I make this work for me? So that's when I actually suggested that uh, when he, he was curious about stand-up, so I had him watch my stand-up. And I said, tell me how I can get better. What didn't you like about it? When did you want to turn it off? As a, as a young guy who doesn't have kids, did you relate to anything there? So I actually ended up getting good feedback on my stand-up set. And, and the fact that he was willing to talk about interesting topics, I made it interesting for me. I was like, what's your greatest fear? <laughs> What's the biggest amount of money you've ever lost in a day? The fun stuff. I, the, most people won't have those kind of conversations with you. So yes, and. Now, how does this relate to you? You probably, um, you might not be in a situation like this anytime soon. Um, but this applies to every area of life. It especially applies to parenting. I was thinking about how much this applies to parenting. When, when something happens with your kids, and this is true of kids of any ages, but especially as they get older, they start developing their own ideas and, and making choices. Probably the best thing you could do as a parent is have a yes and mentality to anything you encounter with your family, to anything you encounter with your kids. So to give you an example, I hear a lot because of my background, you know, I was lifelong atheist, converted to Catholicism. A lot of people email me, say, okay, my kid just told me they're an atheist. And what they're looking for is the paint by numbers. You know, how do I get them to be like you? I want them to go, I want them to get the reverse Uno card there. Like, how do we, <laughs> how do we get them back? And I, it, and I, I mean, I've given different answers to it. The reality is, I mean, faith is a relationship with God and people like to think of it. Parents so often with stuff like that, they think of it their mindset is like they're winning an argument. They want to control their kids into the right way to think. They're like they're they're basically like Jen. How do I get them to stop being wrong? But think about this. If think of it like you're trying to set up an arranged marriage. Let's say this was back in the day when you could arrange marriages for your kids. You found the perfect spouse, 
but and and you're really certain like seriously th- this is this is let's say you're talking about um a son like this this I've found the right girl like seriously I just know it that they're going to be an amazing couple well you wouldn't berate your son and be like why don't you like Sally There's, <laughs> I'm tired of your attitude about Sally She's well perfect. obviously that's not going to get him to fall in love with Sally so how would you do it how would you get him to be interested in Sally well first of all you'd probably hang out with Sally you'd invite her over you'd be like isn't Sally great um so I'm analogizing almighty God to a girl named Sally <laughs> but you see where I'm going with this faith is this is a little bit of a tangent hit the just a little bit of a tangent button just Caitlin a yeah that's our special sound effect but it's just a slight tangent um on that issue of kids and faith specifically it's like Again, faith is a relationship with God. Um, God does exist, guys. Sometimes you forget that actually when you're arguing with your kids about um, faith, and so it's just you're just trying to get them to have a relationship with someone. And arguing and points and box checking and being hostile about it and being really cold and controlling with that—it's like th- that's not going to make them fall in love with God. Um, so think of it like you're do whatever you would do if you were trying to get your kid to fall in love with someone in an arranged marriage it's it's the same principles um but okay so with the yes and thing that yes and mentality puts you in the right mindset to help your kids on whatever journey you think they may need to go on so to give the atheist example if your son announces like i don't i don't believe in god anymore and you think that's a problem and you'd like to help him find his way back you do have to start with that yes and i know you don't want to because you want to control your kids because you think that you can perfectly control the way they turn out and uh Man, by the way, the more I go on in parenting, I I really think that God just gives your kids certain motivation level personalities. I th- sometimes I feel like you could have replaced me with a chia pet, and <laughs> my kids still would have turned out great. You know, what I mean, they're just they're like just kind of naturally motivated and organized. I'm like, I don't think this was me because they're better than me. So like, <laughs> it definitely was not my inspiration that got them to do this stuff. Um, but so. The yes and mentality, what if your kid gets into something that you disagree with and and you think is bad? I mean, obviously, it's a little different, you know, if they're, you know, dealing heroin, like, okay, that's a little (laughs) emergency situations might call for a different response. But if it is, if it's the typical, you know, they're adopting a worldview that you think is unhealthy and won't bring them to good places in their lives, start with yes, and then and. So... Again, so your son tells you, I don't believe in God anymore. So yeah, start with that yes. So really, okay, yes. Yes meaning I hear you. And yes meaning I'm curious. So tell me more. What what was it what was it that led you to this conclusion? I'd like to hear more about that. And just listen. Parents never listen. They never listen. When their kids adopt a worldview that they don't like, immediately the parents hit them with a wall of words. They they start preaching and telling them things. And a lot of times when I've asked parents, they'll say, Jen, my, my kids, like, they're atheists and they're into all this stuff. I'll say, and they'll say, give me your advice. And I'll say, okay, well, first of all, let's figure out, you know, what led them to this? Did they, did they find some old Richard Dawkins videos online? That's pretty easy <laughs> to debunk. Like, what was it that led them to this? And the parents don't know. And I say, well, that's problem number one. They're like, you weren't listening. You didn't, you didn't ask them how they came to this conclusion. Mm-hmm. So that's where you get that. that. That's why the yes is so important. So your kid tells you they've adopted some worldview that sounds insane to you. Um, these, I mean, kids these days, parents hear the crazy. It's, it'll be like, I'm mom, I am part of a polyamorous polycule that, takes place entirely on the internet i mean this like (laughs) i've heard like six or seven examples of this with with what kids are into these days so i i understand that it's hard to have a yes and attitude with that but i'm telling you just just (laughs) do it yes not yes like i think this is a great idea but yes meaning i heard you i heard you um so tell me more about that you know so how did you what makes you feel like being part of this kind of system is good or will lead to good things. And you're like, just tell me more. I'm going to shut up. I'll shut my mouth. Just talk. Tell me about that. That's the yes. And then the 
and is you build on it. So to go back to the atheist example, so if you know your your kid tells you he's an atheist, so yes, I hear you. Tell me how you got to that point. Okay. And have you considered another perspective? Did you ever read this one book that is more from our worldview? And and maybe maybe they'll they'll say something back that is more contrary and you say yes and to that. And Yes, and promotes curiosity, it promotes dialogue, and it is the best skill I have to give you in relationships, as, and not just with your kids. I will say, as of this recording, we, well, as of when this is released, one week from the release day of this episode, let me see if this is true, yes, yes, one week from the release day of this episode, I will have been married 20 years. And yes, and uh, and I mean, we've been dating for 22, 23 years, and then we have six kids. Oldest is 18, turning out very well. So I have some experience with relationships. And I will say probably the, the greatest thing you could do to have a thriving family life, both with your marriage and with your kids, is to have that yes and attitude. You know what? Let's use marriage as an example. Um, Sometimes when your spouse is upset, that can be very stressful. You can imagine with my career, there have been times when things got stressful because I had been gone quite a bit. There was a lot going on at home. Joe has his own life he's trying to manage. And um, yes, we generally make it work. But did we <laughs> have there been moments where we had to figure things out? Oh, oh, look at the way this episode it hit the <laughs> this episode ties together perfectly button. It's like a tapestry, the way these podcast episodes come together. We had to iterate. We had to iterate with my career having six kids and me having a career that is predicated on travel. We had to iterate. It 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 didn't work perfectly straight out of the gate yes there there was tension there were arguments there were phone calls where like I, i'm in another city and he's really upset about something that's going on and there's tension about whose fault is it that our house is a flaming dumpster fire and i'm not there to deal with it yeah we've been there we had to iterate to figure this out and for those of you who are in relationships or who have been in relationships, you know it is a uniquely stressful situation. When your spouse is upset about something, it is a uniquely stressful situation. It is tempting to kind of freeze up and respond with like, well, I'm going to tell them how it is. And I'm, first thing I need to do is defend myself and tell them how it is. And you get in that place. If you can flip into a yes and mentality, it will change your relationship, and it will change your life. It's not easy to do. It takes practice. But now when there are moments of tension, Joe's upset about something, I think I can tell from context clues that he erroneously perceives that I am the cause of this bad situation. <laughs> Everything in me wants to get defensive and start arguing and placing blame and whatever. But I work very hard to bring a yes and mentality. So that yes means curiosity and listening. So he comes at me with a vibe of anger and I shut my mouth. I bring a yes mentality, a curiosity mentality, and I listen. And it's very hard to keep my mouth shut while I'm listening. Very, very hard. I mean, truly just, mm -hmm. I am, I am, it's a moment of truly walking with the Lord. Um, to keep my mouth shut and just stay in that yes, curious, I'm letting you lay out your vision of this improv sketch that our entire <laughs> life is. Isn't this amusing for the audience? And then when he is done explaining his point of view, then we get to the and, and notice it's not but, it's not yes, but. That very important distinction. It's not yes, but. Like, well, yes, you're mad about that, but what about when you, no, 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 no. It's yes, and so it's building on, okay, I I would be totally angry too. Yes, I get it. And I would like to show you this perspective that I think we had a miscommunication because I thought I was supposed to be doing X and you thought I was supposed to be doing Y and that's where this tension came up. 
that is an and mentality. So I, I'm I'm affirming your feelings here and I am building on them to see if together we can journey to a different place. And again, it's the same thing with your kids if they're adopting an ideology or, or a worldview that's concerning to you. The yes is the curiosity and the listening. And then the and is the building on that. So wh- how can we go on this journey together to explore together some different perspectives and just different ways of of thinking about things? Yes, and and it really applies to anything in life. If you're stuck in a job, let's say you have a toxic boss and, and you're unhappy about the situation, the yes doesn't mean like I accept this job forever. It just means all right, today I still have this job. So how can I be open and be curious about what I might be able to take away from it today? How can I maybe see something positive with with my boss or at least make it less miserable for me? And, And I will build on where would I like to go from here? How would I like to use this as a jumping off point? But when you start with that yes, you stop churning up negativity, resentment, defensiveness, and you relax into an open and curious space. And when you're in that mental place, watch how quickly God inspires you. We talked about this on the last episode, I think. It was either on there or on Patreon. Whatever. See, you need to be on my Patreon because I might have only talked about this on <laughs> Patreon. I can't remember. Patreon.com slash this is Jen. Um, you, you need to understand that your best ideas will come from God, not from you, but you can't hear the voice of the divine if your chattering brain is flipping out and resisting everything and just like pushing against your whole life. I hate this job. My boss is like, again, he's giving me this attitude and I'm having these issues with kids and with family and spouse and I have no money. And you, you know, you're pushing, you're resisting. You're not grateful for anything. When you stop resisting and you get in that yes and mentality, I've already said it's a posture of curiosity and listening, but it's also a a posture of gratitude. When you say yes to the situation that's in front of you, you're 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 looking at what's good about it. Like with your, your with your kid who tells you he's an atheist, you're saying, you know, hey, yes, this kid is curious. They're asking questions. I actually appreciate that about them, and I'm going to affirm that. I kid, I love your curiosity. I think that's cool that you question things. That's going to serve you well in life. Yes. And let's keep asking questions. Let's keep, like, don't stop your question asking there. Let's keep asking questions together in this improv sketch that you and I have been thrown into in life. And so when you have that that posture of gratitude, in addition to listening and curiosity, God will just give you ideas. He'll give you ideas. You'll be like, oh, I never, I never thought of that. I, oh, I should say this to that kid. Or, oh, I should explain this to my spouse. Or, ooh, I could go for this job. I'd never thought of this, but I bet I could get this job if I apply for it. God will inspire you. Your best ideas come from God, but you can't hear them if you're in a no but mentality instead of a yes and mentality or a yes but mentality. You need to be in a yes and mentality. So just try to foster that. Just try to bring it to every area of life, whether you're with um, a guy who's had 10 vodka shots on a plane (laughs) on a Southwest flight from Austin to Vegas or whether you just have some interpersonal dynamics with your family or, or just maybe... You're single, you, you're not raising a family, but you have a crazy work situation or your friends are annoying you. Yes, and will transform your whole mindset and your whole life. And that is it for this episode. JFComedyTour.com is where you get tickets to my comedy tour. Patreon.com slash this is Jen is where you join my hot fire Patreon. And in fact, we will leave the cameras and the recording equipment running. And right now we will go into the after party where I will continue talking about this and related subjects. So join me over there on patreon.com slash this is Jen. <laughs>